In fact, God loves making you unique. He didn't create two people the same. Even twins are not the same. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And God works through different people in different ways. We looked at the enemies of uniqueness was comparing. And we said, don't compare yourself with somebody else. Don't compare your children with somebody else. Don't compare the one child with the other child. We are completely unique. Second Corinthians said, do not, we do not compare ourselves. It is foolish, Paul said to the church in, uh, in Corinth. In, in fact, God's given us different gifts. Thank God for that. Different gifts. Even in uh, putting the whole retreat together, it's a different all different giftedness have come together to put that retreat together. And that's why it will be special because not all of us are good at everything. In fact, no one is good at everything. We need to bring people's uniqueness in and uh, to use it to God's glory. The second thing that destroys uniqueness is conforming. Hey, I want to be like her. So you go to the plastic surgeon and say, hey, I want to be like Beyonce, so please put a little filler in there or a little there, and, and we want to look like other people. There's this woman obsessed with um, Michael Jackson, not this fo woman. So she's, she's uh, had spent millions of dollars having surgery so she can look like Michael Jackson. And I've got bad news for her. Michael Jackson does not look like Michael Jackson. Do not conform yourself to the standards of this world, but let God transform you. In other words, we imitate Jesus. That's our job is we conform to Jesus. He's our model. We are created in the image of God to be his ambassadors to imitate Jesus. And uh, then we saw the way to do that. Um, so, sorry, sorry. Number, point, num point number one is to accept their uniqueness completely. Number two, affirm their value constantly. Because the world's putting you down. Our job as parents is to make sure our children are affirmed. Even as adults, we need to be affirmed. We, it's nice for somebody to come around and say, well done. You're doing a good job. Congratulations. Keep going. We like that. That's why we have award ceremonies. That's why we have uh, prize givings to tell people you are doing a great job. And we need to do that constantly with our children. Uh, you remember... They are unique. They are valuable. Um, a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground. The Lord knows about it. We looked at it last week. Why are, our, why are our children so valuable? Why are we so valuable? God custom made us. You remember last week I gave you some examples of that. God custom made us. No two people alike. Number two, Jesus died for you. Uh, as Andre reminded us this morning. And God's spirit lives in you. You are valuable. And we, then we looked at ways to affirm this. Ways to affirm this is, number one, visual attention, physical affection, and verbal appreciation. Visual, visual attention, we looked at that's why children like to grab you by the, by the cheeks. They turn their face. You can look them in the eyes. And that's why you've heard me say it many times from this pulpit. We've spoken about it again. Parents especially of young children, do not eat your meals, especially supper time, in front of the TV. That's a special time to have visual attention. And if you're eating your meals in front of the TV, your attention is there, your child is telling us how you got beat up at school and your mind is somewhere else, there needs to be, you, there needs to be eye to eye. The, in fact, to use a Greek word, panim to panim, face to face. Like when we meet God one day, it will not be you. Sorry, God, I've just got a busy, I've just got to send this SMS, you know, this text or whatever, WhatsApp. We need to give our children visual attention. And we saw that scripture, your Father in heaven pays great attention to you, Matthew chapter 10, verse 30. Physical affection, we love on them, we hug on them. God has made our skins very special. Your children love for you to touch them, especially our little children love to climb up on our laps. It's one of the greatest joys in life to hold a, a small baby, to have a child on your lap, to be able to, to sit next to your flesh and blood, to hold hands, put an arm around a shoulder, to give a hug. God designed us. And we looked at he, Hosea chapter 11 and verse 4. I drew them in, God speaking, I drew them in to me with affection and love. I picked them up and I held them to my cheek. God speaking. And then, of course, verbal 
appreciation. In other words, God said, you are precious. Our children need to have verbal lift up. We need to tell them verbally, I love you. I love you. You are amazing. You're doing great. You've, you're growing up to be a, a champion for the Lord in this life. Proverbs 12 and verse 25, a word of encouragement does wonder. Now, today we get into our number three uh, on, our, on our, uh, our two-part series, and this is um, talking, talking about ways to lift our children up. Number three, write it into your notes, trust them with increasing responsibility. Trust them with increasing responsibility. Folks, this is very, very, very important. And there's different ways to do this, and we're going to speak about them, but nothing brings out the best in you faster than someone, having someone believe in you and trust you with responsibility. And unfortunately, we're bringing up our children, we do everything for them. In other words, we don't trust them uh, with responsibility, and it destroys our children. They grow up to be nothing in this this world. If you want a child to grow up to be well-rounded, you have to trust them with responsibility. So, uh, so some years back, and I'm, I'm maybe let's go back a few decades. Uh, maybe uh, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how long ago, but I went to a parenting course at uh, Westville Boys High School, and uh, I sat next to Shamila Batoy. Does anybody know who that is? That uh, that is our new director of public prosecutions, just appointed by. Um, uh, president, uh, our president Cyril Ramaphosa, and he has just appointed this lady. It was at that time she was busy prosecuting Hansi Cronier. Do you remember? For those of you who remember that, yeah. And and and, and we sit next to the this, uh, each other through this this course, and uh, we had this instructor who was this guru on child rearing, and he said some stuff that I, that I just we we never implemented in our home. But he said, if you want your child to grow up healthy, uh, you need to give them responsibility. And one of the things he said that you have to do is let them make their own lunch for school. If you've got school going. So, wow, that's hectic. And Shamila, yeah, we, we're on first name terms. Don't mess with me, okay? I'm sure if she sees me in the street now, she'll say, hey, bruh, she'll never recognize me, unfortunately. It was a long time ago. But, uh, but we, you're going to be joking. And this guy was absolutely adamant that we've got to trust our children from an early age, give them responsibility. Now, here's a, here's a way that I will agree uh, with him, folks, and, and we see it in, in our schooling system, is parents or, or children forget to pack their, their lunch into their bags. They, they come to school, they've got no lunch. So guess what? Mom or dad has to leave work, drive all the way, you know, come to the office, sorry, this is a my son, daughter, left their lunch at home. I want to encourage you, parents, you never do that. You never do that. Your child will not die, okay? By the time they go home at two, half past two, or whatever it is. They can drink water, okay? And, and if the children come to the office and uh, say, please, phone my mother, I left my lunch at home, sorry, drink water. You will be, you will be okay. Because you're not going to, if you, you're not going to do that on a repeated basis. If you don't learn responsibility at an early age, you know, if you're always going to have mom and dad bailing you out, you're going to grow up to be a nothingness in this life. And, uh, you know, these days we've got all these leadership courses and all these different courses. The best way to learn to lead is to get in there and do it. And, we, and uh, as parents, we need to lead strong and we, lead by, we learn by doing. The way to do that, you can write this into your notes. Number one, how to trust them with increasing responsibility is trust them with small things. Trust them with small things. I give you responsibility even before they can walk while they're in the arms. Hey, listen, if you're at a stage in your life that you can hold your own bottle, you hold your bottle. Mom's not going to hold it for you all the time. Dad's not going to hold it. Hold your own bottle. You know, you unpack in the car, you unclip them from the car seat. If they can carry something into the house, they carry something into the house. And you know what? They So they grow with, you trust them with small things. You know, when children, preschool children, you don't buy them a pony, you buy them a hamster, or you buy them a mouse. 
because the consequences of their neglect are a little, little less, you know. Uh, we, do, we start small, and then we grow in giving our children responsibility, and we start with small things. The, Jesus said, by the way, I've got all these quotes from Jesus. Luke 16, verse 10, whoever can be trusted with a little can also be trusted with a lot. We start with small, show me you're responsible with this thing. And then we'll give you that. You want a puppy? Look after the hamster first. Clean the cage, feed that hamster. If the hamster hasn't died in 10 years, then we'll get you a, <laughs> then daddy will buy you a puppy. You know. We start with small things. Number two, trust them with possessions and money. Trust them with possessions and money. Now, a lot of you uh, uh, ask, when should we start giving our children pocket money? I want to suggest before they need it. And let me tell you why. Because this is an opportunity to say money has value. You look after it. You put it in a safe place. You make sure a, a part of that, you, you give back to the Lord all the time. You give back to the Lord on a regular basis. Um, look at uh, what Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, verse 11. If you cannot be trusted with worldly possessions, then who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? We, we give them. And by the way, folks, of all the things, money is the acid test. Money is the acid test. It, it, it's the biggie. It's the biggie. Because that's kind of where possessions head on. If you cannot be trusted with money, you cannot be trusted with other things. And when, when you start earning an income, what do you do with it? How you give back to the Lord? How, how you disciplined are you in your savings? How, how disciplined are you in keeping a track record of what you spend? Money is the acid test. Number three, trust them with things that don't belong to them. Trust them with things that don't belong to them. To them, by the way, folks, you own, the only way that you learn responsibility is by being given is by being given responsibility. How, how do you learn responsibility? You don't take a course on responsibility. You are given responsibility, and then you see how you do with that small responsibility. And when you're given that small responsibility, you get hey, a bigger responsibility. Hey, Dad, I, I want a I want a guitar. I don't want to. Okay, I'll tell you what, Dad hasn't played his guitar for a while. I'm going to leave that guitar in your room. You look after it. Make sure you don't bash it around. Make sure when your friends come over, it's put in a safe place. You look after that guitar. We'll see how you do. You say you want a guitar and that you're going to promise to play it and practice every day. That's your responsibility. It's not your guitar, by the way. My guitar. But I'm going to give you responsibility over a thing that doesn't belong to you. And we'll see how you do with that guitar. And eventually, if you practice, if you do your lessons and, and you work and... and, 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 and um, and you learn to it, you look after it, you know, we will think about giving you a guitar. You know, all of us are in deep need of being trusted. We like people to trust us. But trust is earned in a big way. So we start with small things. We show our parents. We show our school teacher. We show the principal. We show the boss, well, the, the lecturer. We are responsible and people will give us more and more responsibility. Here's an interesting uh, observation. You know, Jesus trusted his disciples with the world's salvation. Hey, after three years, I'm out of here. Your job now. You go into all the world and spread the God. Not my job anymore. And so Jesus sent, his, sent the disciples out. They had struggles. They made mistakes. M making mistakes is part of living. And uh, there were squabbles, you know. Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, and there, there were squabbles, and uh, Peter did this, and you know, Thomas, yeah. So, but that's part of life, and we trust our children with small things, and it grows from there. Uh, from there. Folks, let's allow our children to make mistakes. If we so petrified our children, are always going to make mistakes. We're not going to trust them, and they won't feel like that we trust them and we love them. So what we do is we give them responsibility, we allow them to make mistakes, and the, and the rule is, you know, even in, in companies, you know, people, employees make mistakes. The thing is, you don't make the same mistake over and over and over again. Making a mistake once is, 
It's not the worst thing in the world. We learn from our mistakes. But you do it over and over again, then you can find yourself another job. You do the same thing over again, find yourself some other parents. No, we don't do that. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 7. Love never gives up. I love that new song that we sung. Love never fails, it never gives up. I love that song. Love, and it comes from here, by the way. Love never gives up. I love the songs that sing scripture. Never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstances. And so we love our children while they grapple with increased loads of responsibility. And, and I, I want to encourage you parents, um, hand that responsibility over. And, and if you are blessed enough to have help in your house, don't let the help take the responsibility of your children. Those are your shoes. You clean your shoes. If you want your, uh, if you want your lunch packs in, bring back your lunchbox from school. You know, make your own bed. You, you uh, change clothes, take your clothes, you put them in. We're not going to wash them unless they go into the waste, uh, the, the clothes basket or whatever. Your family has developed it. You, you, you know what goes on in your house. But if you're always, always taking responsibility of your children, it, it is, it goes, is a, it's a major problem. My son, pay attention to me and watch closely what I do. Proverbs 23. And verse 26. And listen to this. This is really important. Any time I take responsibility for someone, I take responsibility away from them. If I keep on doing stuff for my children, I, I'm taking responsibility away from them. They grow up. I, I tell you what, this was a... Uh, you can get frustrated when I watch some of what's going on today. Did you see the, 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 the head of the financial department, the University of Free State? Students caught him on the stairs going to his office. They just beat him up this week. He was assaulted. And I'm looking, and, and of course it's a viral video. Many of you have probably seen it. What's going on there? I'm seeing students who were never given responsibility, never disciplined in a home, never taught morals, never taught character. I, or, you know, by mom and dad or whoever was the caregiver. And so they, they come into this life and it's a, it's an entitlement life. Everyone demanding their rights, but no one demanding that they take responsibility before you have rights. We see this too much in our world today. Um, Jesus said to his disciples, you go into all the world and you teach them. He didn't say go into all the world and you do for them. You teach them. Our job as parents is to teach our children so they can do for themselves. Otherwise, they leave home and they, they don't even know how to run their own homes because mom did everything for them. You know, the maid, somebody else always, you know, they always, somebody always says to, to catch up, pick up the slack. And, and uh, you know, they get married and they're totally useless to their wives because they cannot be the leaders or, or, or the other way around in their, um, in their homes. Anytime I take up responsibility for them, I take it away from them them. Um, one of the other ways that uh, we, we can destroy uh, this, uh, our, our children is overprotection. When we're always protecting them. By the way, overprotection is a form of rejection. It's a form of rejection. Because when I overprotect my children, it says, you're not competent. Dad, mom has to step in for you. Overprotection says, I don't trust you. When we overprotect our children, it creates insecure kids. And so what we really encourage you is that when our children are in trouble at school, uh, we don't march in there and, and demand that our children get let off detention or whatever. We trust the teacher, we trust the principal, and said, if they said, you, you take responsibility for your learning. Hey, if you've left it to the last minute to do your project, I'm not going to do it. You're going to get into trouble at school the next day. Don't expect uh, mom and dad at, you know, 10 o'clock at night to run and try and find some shop that's open to buy the cardboard and stuff that you need. No, 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 no. You, we're not going to protect you if you are not responsible. It says we love you. We trust you. We, you, just, you just grow in on your own. Number four, number four, number four is correct without condemning. Correct 
without condemning. We all need correction. Proverbs 3 and verse 12. The Lord disciplines those he loves, just like a father corrects the child that he delights in. Parents discipline children they delight in. Now, folks, we're not talking about punishment. Punishment is a penalty for the past. But correction and a discipline is correcting for the future. And regrettably, we live in an age where we've got all these experts that reject discipline. And guess what? We, we, we are breeding generations that are out of control, that cannot be responsible themselves, that wreck everything, want everything from free, want to do everything for nothing. Is because they didn't grow up in homes where they were taught, uh, where they were disciplined in love. The Bible says, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, if you refuse to discipline your children, it proves you don't love them. If you do not discipline your children, it proves you don't love them. If you love your children, you will be prompt to discipline them. Discipline them, correcting for the future. Proverbs 19, verse 18. Discipline your children while they are young enough to learn. If you don't, you are helping them destroy themselves. Discipline is correcting for the future. And how do we correct without condemning? Well, we never correct in anger. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Fathers, don't keep on scolding and nagging your children making them angry and resentful. Instead, bring them up with the loving discipline that God approves with suggestions and godly advice. We discipline them uh, and we never do it in anger. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25, don't use harmful words, use only helpful words, the kind that build up. Folks, we've got to be very careful when we discipline our children. In fact, here's a word. Here's a word for you, you, uh, you parents who don't have children yet, but I freely give it to you from years of experience. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. <laughs> How many of you have used that word before? <laughs> Correcting in anger. Punishing in Disciplining in anger creates resentment. But correcting in love builds responsible kids who say, recognize I've messed up, I won't do it again. Discipline in anger, when you discipline in anger, it's just, it's just getting even. <laughs> you know, I remember the old, uh, the old Afrikaans expression, loyal. Uh, you, know, you know that expression? Loyal, is that, have I, Manette, have I got it right? Eh? Loyal, that means just grab that, you got it right, you just, and you just beat the fuzz out. No, that's not what we talk, that's not Bible expression. You don't just, as fast as they run, you run a little bit faster and you smack it. That is not biblical discipline. You might change behavior that way, but you damage a relationship. And discipline never is intended, never should damage a relationship between a parent and a child. And harmful words become harmful memories. Harmful words become harmful memories. When, you, when you're hitting a child, you're beating a child, uh, which is, and you tell them how useless and they are, and they, they create harmful memories. But uh, we need to, the Bible says, speak the truth in love. And our final point this morning, number five, love them fiercely. Love them fiercely and forgive them. Ephesians 4 and verse 32, be kind and loving to each other, forgiving each other. Children make mistakes. They are children. They the child, you the parent. Just, and, and forgiving them just as God forgave you in Christ. And then that never give up. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7. Love knows no limits to its endurance. Doesn't matter how many times your children fail, you discipline them, you bring them back. There's no limits to your love. No end, it, uh, no end to its trust. 
no fading of its hope. It can outlast anything. A fantastic passage of scripture. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 10. The mountains and hills may crumble, but my love for you will never end. So says the Lord who loves you. If your children feel there is no boundaries, there's nothing that they could do to break your love from you, you you've got a wonderful thing. You've done a great thing in, in their lives, and you'll have a lifelong relationship. And our final passage of Scripture, Rebel, uh, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 26. Reverence for God gives a man deep strength. His children have a place of refuge and security. We train up our children in the way of the Lord. When I look at those students beating up that, uh, that bursa in the free state there, I, those children didn't grow up in Sunday school. They didn't have a mom or a dad or a grandma or, uh, or, or an auntie telling them about the love of Jesus and, and nurturing them and disciplining them in the way of the, of the Lord. And that's why it's so critical that we get our children and our grandchildren, we get them in children's church and to Sunday school. And from the earliest possible age, they're learning, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Let me read to you something. How a, how a parent raises their child, the love that they give, the values that they teach, the emotional environment they offer, the education they provide, influences not only their children, but four generations to follow. This is interesting, a study that was done by a sociologist. It's, it's, called, um, it's called the five-generation five rule. Never heard of it, but it sounds sense and, and makes sense to me. And, and these in, it influenced their children, not only their children, but the generations to follow and four generations to follow. Their generation and four generations to follow either for good or for bad, for evil. Jonathan Edwards was the most outstanding leader in America in the early 1700s. That's a long time ago. Edwards also demonstrated a strong sense of duty in his role as a father. He and his wife, Sarah, they had 11 children. 11 children, that's what they did. No TV those days. For him, he also charged to make time. There was another man who lived in New York at the same period of time. His name was Max Jukes. The Jukes family, uh, the Jukes family originally was studied by a sociologist by the name of Richard Dugdale, and he was described in the book he published in 1877. Rolling, that was like just before you were born. As for Edward's description, uh, Edward's descendants, listen to this. This is what that was discovered. Edward's, this great man. Edward's descendants, they included a U.S. vice president, three senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college professors, 30 judges, 65 profess professors, 18 public office holders, 100 lawyers, 62 physicians, 75 army officers, and 100 clergymen, missionaries, and theological professors. They, there were practically no lawgivers in those generations. On the other hand, Duke's describes, uh, the Duke's descendants, this, this was the New York Goods guy. He, his descendants included seven murderers, 60 thieves, 128 prostitutes, 50 of these uh, averaging 15 years of harlotry, 145 other convictions, 280 indigents, and 440 who were physically wrecked by indulgent living through, uh, through the addiction to alcohol. Out of the 1,200 descendants studied, 300 died prematurely, 67 were reported to have contracted syphilis. Moreover, it was estimated that Duke's descendants cost the states in the 1800s about 20 million rand. It makes a difference what you're doing, not only to this generation, to your children, but your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. Five generations, the way that you parent 
in the bringing up your children in the nurture of the admonition of the Lord has generational generational uh, effect. Let's pray together and then we'll sing. Our Father in heaven, we, 